All right. So for those of you that are asking, yes, this will be recorded. Um, that means if you need to go to the bathroom break at any point, that's acceptable. It's okay. We're not taking attendance. Uh, or are we? Um, thanks again, everybody. Um, we have a really exciting panel ahead of us today. Uh, we're going to try to start here right now uh, in efforts to uh, keep to the time slot allotted. So AV thought leadership. We're taking a little bit of a different approach to this upcoming webinar for today, where we're trying to figure out trends together as a team. And I think what you're going to learn here from the amazing panel we have is that beyond the technology, beyond the design capabilities, it's the research that we're seeing in real time to execute on what that next generation workplace can actually look like. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction. I, I behoove everybody to stay as long as they can to listen to everything we're saying. Um, we have a phenomenal panel here. Uh, first off, I'll, uh, I'll let Scott give a quick wave to everybody so they know who you are from WaveGuide and then, uh, introduce yourself, please. Hey everybody, Scott Walker. I'm the president and founder of WaveGuide. Uh, we're an independent AVIT and acoustics consulting firm. We also have a software division. We also do data analytics. We also do on-site managed services. Uh, we've been in business about 25 years, offices all over the U.S. and we uh, got acquired four years ago by a company called Compass Group, who's the world's largest food service hospitality company. Thank you, Scott. Pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Um, next up, um, I think we're going to stick to the state of Georgia for a quick minute here. Uh, Britton, go for it. Introduce yourself. Give me a quick wave as well. Hi, my name is Britton Gates. I'm a senior associate and audiovisual consultant with Newcomb and Boyd in Atlanta. We're a full services uh, architectural engineering firm with an extensive special technology group that includes intelligent buildings, specialty lighting, uh, theatrical, acoustics, physical security network, telecom, and AV. Um, and the best way to reach me after this is uh, LinkedIn if you'd like to. Awesome. And Britton, just in case people want to know, how do they get the beer to look like you? If there's any questions, I just we need to know in advance because yeah. I, I don't. Okay. I have these patches. I, how do you do it? Great. Yeah, LinkedIn's great for that too. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, sticking with the Georgia trend, uh, Bill from AB Tech, go for it. Introduce yourself. Give a quick wave. Yeah, my name is Bill Thrasher. I'm the senior vice president here at AV Tech Media Solutions, uh, based in Atlanta. We do work all over the country, enterprise level clients. We're a design build firm uh, specializing in, in, I think, really consultative minded partnerships, AV solutions for enterprise type organizations. Really, corporates are specialty. Um, been doing this a long time and a big Georgia Tech fan, and we're going to be in the tournament Friday, so go Jackets. <laughs> Congrats. Well, absolute pleasure having you. We've been uh, enjoyed working with you over the last few years. Thank you. Um, so as we go a little bit east to west, before we go a little bit more Midwest, I would say, uh, Andy, another Florida resident, I have to give you next up. Go for it. My name is Andy Peak. Um, I, as Hanan mentioned, I am uh, in Fort Lauderdale. I am the, an enterprise and global accounts manager for Logitech. I worked as an AV integrator for over 20 years. Um, as a sales engineer. And so I've been in this game for a long time, since 1997 in various roles. But uh, yeah, now I'm at Logitech helping large organizations come up with roadmaps for virtual communication solutions, um, both in and outside the office. And I, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Andy. You didn't give us a wave, though. Oh, sorry. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and best way to reach me, obviously, LinkedIn. Um, or andypeak at logitech.com. Awesome. Thank you, Andy. And before we go to the Midwest, um, Josh, quick introduction for yourself. Only because I am in Charlotte today, I, I felt, I, I, don't know, I couldn't give you first. I'm sorry. That's fair. That's fair. And I'm, I am in Charlotte, but a uh, big Georgia Bulldog fan. So sorry, sorry, Bill. Um, but uh, yeah, Josh Starkey, I am the director of engineering and programming here at SKC. Uh, I get to work with our fantastic uh, CAD engineering and uh, programming teams. And uh, uh, I've been in the industry for about 20 years and uh, just happy to be here with, uh, with all these great folks. Hey, man. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. And uh, if you're ever looking for a, uh, a good beer, Josh is definitely your guy. He can direct you from sour to sweet. So uh, important to know there as well. Moving more Midwestern, uh, Brad, give a quick wave and introduction if you don't mind. You bet. Brad Souza, CTO at AVI Systems. We're a global provider of AV, UC, digital media, and broadcast technologies, really focused on the human impact and what it means to the people who use our technologies. Awesome. Well, pleasure to have you. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, we have Steve Woods from uh, WSP. Steve, give a quick wave and introduce yourself, please. 
Hey there, everyone. Steve Woods, lead consultant at WSP. We're a global MEPT consultancy firm. Uh, we have many specialties, including building technologies. We do innovation advisory and audiovisual security and telecommunications. Been in the business now for about 15 years, and I got my start in Southern California in the, uh, the luxury home market. Well, pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been also very blessed in working at Prime View with the WSP now for years. Uh, so thank you so much for the business as well. Thank you. Um, so jumping right into it, um, right now we have, for the purpose of the attendees to know, we curated a really unique panel to address specific questions about hybrid models, not hybrid models, next gen workplace, hybrid workplace, what that really entails. So we're going to jump into it. We have some phenomenal questions that are, uh, I love to say that they're not jaded. It's something that collectively we put together as a team here to address, I believe, open issues that people are not addressing as an industry. So I'm really excited that the panel worked collectively with us to create this really unique uh, set of questions. So we're going to jump right into it. So first question is going to be for uh, Scott Walker of Waveguide. Um, so what is the workplace going to look like past that return to work area? You know, are there aspects of disruption that will be with us forever? Um, what can we expect in five years? I know it's a loaded question, but let's uh, let's give it yeah. your best. Well, the interesting thing about the pandemic, two things. One is we just conducted an experiment with a few billion participants. You, you could have never dreamed this up in a laboratory to get this experiment. And what it actually did was pull five years into today. So we're in 2025. It would have taken five years to get to this amount of video traffic, this billions and billions of calls that people have made. Um, we're never going back to not doing that. There will be no rooms that have and rooms that don't have. All rooms will have video going forward. And amazingly, it, the tech held up, right? Other than I think Teams had a little glitch on Monday. But, you know, largely we've been able to conduct most business through this means. What that means is when we go back, every meeting, we just better bank on it being a hybrid meeting. Um, some of this is working for people. In fact, many surveys say, 80 plus percent of people want to work from home a few days a week. So everything we build needs to be with that in mind. And with the fact that people have just spent a year making calls from their laptop, we need to make that experience be what happens when they go back into the office as simple as what they've experienced over the past year. Yeah, excellent. I, I you know, I think the market's clearly changing. And the real question is, is how everyone's going to adopt. And, you know, maybe you could talk, Scott, for a quick second on the you know, also major relocation with that entails, because I know we've discussed this in the past together. Yeah, a lot of clients are realizing they might have too much space. Imagine that. Uh, if people are going to come back in shifts and maybe, you know, Mondays and Fridays might be less populated than the middle of the week, companies are going to have to settle into something where they realize, you know, get, get to a, a common denominator across that five day week because they don't want to have all the real estate on Wednesdays that they're paying for full fare and not need it the rest of the week. So we see that there's gonna be a major shift in how people re-inhabit the workplace. And we see it from architects coming out now, much more of a neighborhood model. People will come in the, to the office to collaborate. That's why we'll get in traffic again or get on mass transit or get on airplanes again, uh, as we were talking about before the call. Um, there better be something on the other end that's compelling. And I think that's us, right? What the tech we put in, we, we need to beckon people back to the office. It has to be better than the experience they have at home, which is pretty good after a year of making it work. So let's make it even better when they make that commute back to the office. God willing. I, uh, I uh, love your comments there. And, uh, you know, we have, you know, also from this panel from the collaboration side there, I apologize, we had some technical difficulties. Uh, in the white shirt, Chris James, uh, if you could give a quick introduction to yourself, and then uh, we'll get right into question number one. Yeah, sure, Shannon. Thanks. And sorry, I jumped in a little bit late. You know, it's maybe a, an ironic lesson learned or something in the hybrid workplace. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Christopher Janes. Uh, my background's computer science. I was a computer science professor for a long time, and then I founded uh, Immersive Technologies, so I'm its CTO. My job is to sort of try to predict where we need to take the technologies that we're developing to support the hybrid workplace and to support engagement in that workplace over time and do that through flexible software. You're muted, Hanan. Sorry about that. Uh, so Chris, the same question to you. Thanks so much for the introduction. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, question one, uh, which is what is the workplace going to look like? We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, it's always risky to try to predict the future, especially when you're a technologist like me, because things change so rapidly. But 
if you look at trends in the past, you know, you can start to look for patterns. And one of the things I think that's really going to be exciting for us and what's going to happen over the next couple of years is that there's been such a disruption in the workplace that usually something good comes out of that because it sort of shakes everything back up, you know, all the way back to things like, you know, you had the cholera epidemic in the, you know, in the industrial revolution, and suddenly we all wanted clean water and better working conditions to, to, to respond to that. What we're going to see now is an increased in, increase in personal choice and flexibility about when and where you work. That's going to put pressure on the technologies that we have to develop and respond to those needs. You know, expectations in the user's mind is, are going to change. And the expectation now will be at any moment, I can walk in anywhere I want, and I should have the ability to collaborate and engage with my colleagues in a way that feels the same, whether I'm sitting in my office, my, you know, my apartment like I'm doing here, or I'm actually sitting in the same room with them. And there's going to be a lot of exciting technologies that kind of come to bear to, to support that. Think of it as like a time machine sort of. We got into this time machine and we jumped forward four or five years because none of the trends that we're probably going to talk about today haven't been here before. It's not like suddenly everything changed. It's just like all accelerated dramatically. So if you, you know, you think back to things you started to hear, like, I, I wish I didn't have all these, you know, third party panels to, to manage to control a conference room, or, um, you know, I wish I had more flexibility in the workplace, or I wish I could have my huddle rooms be as sophisticated as my high end, you know, video conferencing rooms. All of that stuff is going to happen over time really quickly now, given the pandemic and the disruption that we kind of all went through in 2020. Thank you. Um, you know, Chris, I think the changing times, that's, that's a good thing. And I think we all have to embrace it for better or worse. Um, so talking about that, I think a little bit further, you know, what are some of the most prolific pain points for end users in the workplace? And how can, can designers, you know, ad better address them? Um, you know, uh, Britton, I'd love for you to address this one. Sure. Uh, yeah. And I think the, the, the most obvious answer here is reliable systems that a user can expect to work every time they walk into a space. Um, and I think Scott and, and Chris already alluded to this. AV systems are no longer considered standalone presentation systems, especially with a hybrid workforce. We are going into the same virtual meeting space with the same access to resources and tools um, as users in their desktop and mobile devices. So, uh, you know, this yeah, past year, you know, as Scott said, users have grown accustomed to uh, you know, instant one-click reliable joins from their desktop and mobile devices. And that's going to be the absolute expectation when they return to the workplace. It's not a lot of room for custom one-off solutions with the new interfaces that their users have to learn. Um, I think designers can address this by uh, not over-designing with more failure points and also designing systems as an extension of the virtual collaboration space. Um, and I think that success of out of the box AV systems and basically commoditized room solutions rather than a lot of excessive customization is indicative of corporate leadership's uh, frustration with systems that require constant maintenance or introduce yet another system their users have to learn. Yeah, you nailed it. I think, I think Britain, it doesn't matter if the project's in Atlanta, right, or if the project's in Serbia, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it, the reality is these things have to work seamlessly, you know, right. across, across waters. So uh, I'll give the same question there, Josh. You know, we've done a, our fair share of projects together over the years. You know, same question to you. Love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I absolutely agree with Britain, and uh, you know, it just makes me think of the old acronym KISS. Um, but you know, the, the biggest pain point I'm seeing uh, is is really just around getting the meeting started, as Britain and, and others have alluded to. Uh, you know, we're at a point where we can join a whole multitude of disparate meeting platforms from our personal devices. Uh, but interoperability in the meeting room is still somewhat limited. Uh, and, and again, everybody seems to want the same thing. They want to be able to join any meeting platform that might walk through the door uh, with minimal effort, ideally with the press of a single button. Um, there's not really a magic bullet here. So we really need to make sure we fully understand the workflows and preferences of the end users. And, uh, and then, you know, designing rooms to support PC-based conferencing is a great way to to offer up that broad support, but uh, but oftentimes the user experience can suffer. Um, their interop services with for standards-based endpoints uh, are a, a great option, but they require SIP for H three two three dialing capabilities from the meeting organizers end. So, um, you know, luckily a few of the big players in the UC space are beginning to support guest join capabilities, uh, namely Zoom, Teams, and WebEx are the big three. Um, and really, the bottom line is just make sure we have a solid understanding of the end user's needs today as well as down the road. Make sure we educate them around the available options uh, and we're guaranteed success at that point. 
Yeah, you nailed it, Josh. I, I think engaging on an end user level, folks, you know, that's actually why I'm one of Scott forced me to be in Charlotte today uh, to make sure that the end users really know what they're doing on a project. And I think it's so important. I mean, I, I remember firsthand when I was in uh, Boston on a pharmaceutical project and I went to go see post, you know, post installation that the integrator did to see what the project looked like, you know, and to see, I, like I always joke, another one of my babies, another project. And when I went on site, I went to go meet the CEO. Uh, the CIO, I'm sorry. And I'm like, where's Jimmy, Jimmy, whatever his name was. And he goes, oh, he's fired. I'm like, what? I'm like, the project was installed like, like, like a few weeks ago. He goes, yeah. Uh, they never asked the CEO his input about the space. So he got fired when the space opened. And I can't express that enough because how important it is to have end user engagement on the people who actually use the room. And you nailed it, Josh. You know, there is no magic bullet, but keeping things simple means engaging everybody in the project, right? Um, so moving right along, let's talk about those hybrid workplaces, you know, and I'll give um, Chris this question to you. What type of hybrid workplaces do you think are the most important? You know, are there tools, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you got to you got to remember that this, you know, 2020 really shone a light on the different types of work styles that facilitate different types of outcomes, right? So I think I think we always knew that, hey, there's personal productivity spaces for personal productivity time, like an office. There's group collaboration areas with whiteboards, flip charts, and things like that. But I think we've kind of ignored the fact that, you know, just like you wouldn't want to be sitting in a, in a group setting in an open area pit working on your personal productivity tasks, you don't want to collaborate alone. And so I think we really have to start to design spaces that are very specific. And, you know, keep in mind, too, when you return to work, you, yeah, that's going to be a very precious time for you now. Right. You're going to know that, hey, you know, it's, it looks like people are starting to settle in on this idea that it's going to be a couple of days a week that I'm going to work from home. I'm going to choose those days whenever I want to do it. But when I go into the office, that's going to be a precious moment for me to find and engage with my collaborators. That's why I went there. Right. It's not I went there because it's 9 a.m. on a Monday. I went there because I'm looking for collaboration or I'm looking for resources that are in that space. So I think the hybrid workplace will start to be very well defined around these things. And one of, one of the approaches I've seen some of our customers starting to take is to deploy cameras almost everywhere. Because when I roll into that space, I wanna be able to sit down you know, in a, in a huddle room or wherever and be able to engage with colleagues that maybe didn't decide to come into that space that day. You know, It's kind of exciting because it creates a whole new class of problems that we as developers and designers and technologists have to solve. Like, how can I find my collaborators in that space now? If I show up on a campus and it's time for me to you know, sit with my team, but none of them came to the space or two of them are upstairs and I don't know it and I'm down in a huddle space, how does the technology enable me to become engaged with those team members again? And those are things we're starting to study for sure uh, and, and gonna even launch some products around that, that concept. So Chris, talking about you know collaboration solutions, you know obviously when we are even thinking about building our new experience center in Florida, naturally I called upon Andy. <laughs> uh, so Andy, I would love to hear the same you know question really for yourself uh, from a Logitech perspective. You know what type of hybrid are you seeing? So the hybrid solutions are coming across the entire gamut, whether it's in office or work from home, and the focus needs to be really on those. Um, several of the panel members have mentioned the. Uh, need for simplicity and for standardization. Uh, that is crucial, whether it is your work from home equipment or your office equipment, because if you have standardized on a single platform, right, uh, whether it be Zoom or Teams and standardized on a particular manufacturer, then everyone has a uniform experience, no matter where they're working, and it increases efficiency. And at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of people work looked at the work from home model at, through a through kind of a two-dimensional lens, right? Based on employee productivity. Um, how can I, you know, and it was more of an oversight thing, right? How can I make sure that my employees are working and things like that? But with, with data analysis and all of that, that, that stuff's covered. It, it, the third dimension of that that is coming to light is the inc increased efficiency and the increased profitability of the hybrid work model because let's say I'm a road warrior sales rep, in the old days, I might, with travel time, be lucky to see two or three clients in a day. But now you can see eight, 10, 12 even. And so the increased efficiency and benefits of that, no, nothing, no one's ever gonna replace 
some face-to-face -face meetings, right? But virtual communications really allow you to engage with your client in a face-to-face -face manner that you can accomplish multiple tasks in one meeting, right? Because you can pull multiple people into a single meeting. And so I would recommend that, that large corporations, they, they seem to get a lot of tunnel vision on the huddle space, conference room type of solutions, which are very important, right? But also the home work environment to have your employees have high quality camera solutions, high quality headset microphone solutions. And you'll see the platforms like uh, Teams and, and Zoom and, and Google Meet and all of these will start to um, evolve because we are in a paradigm shift where the average conference room is going to be half the cost of what it used to be, right? So these VC deployments are, it's changed everything. That, I mean, and the hybrid model is, is, go, is here to stay because companies can save so much money by reducing their brick and mortar operations, deploy a portion of that, those savings to technology solutions that actually increase employee productivity. Yeah, I think you nailed it there, Andy. It's funny. I was talking to uh, one of my friends who's a designer in uh, Northern California, uh, my friend Joey uh, from DNA. And um, he was telling me one of his software clients, 24,000 employees, you know, they got to figure out a working from home solution. And it's like they're scrambling. So everything that you alluded to, I mean, these are real issues. And uh, thank you for your feedback there. So next question, um, given all the commoditization happening in AV right now, how do we create value for our clients and where can manufacturers add more value? You know, I'd love to hear from a consultant's perspective, uh, Steve Wood, North California, another boy from Steve, Northern California. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, I love this question. I, you know, every individual technology now seems to be becoming more fully featured. And so an individual gadget can solve many, many needs. However, as a consultant and as a salesperson, we have to help the client understand the why because even the most robust technologies have limited value without the why. So we create value by really sussing out the client's interests and their business goals, and then connecting that goal with the technology by use of a measurable KPI. And so, you know, we may find that sometimes clients don't have goals. Uh, you know, it's rare, but it does happen. And so what we endeavor to do is to help them establish something to give context and really a reason for the technology. Even if that goal is to reduce energy consumption by a certain percent by a certain year, or just eliminate that meeting setup time. That way we can create buy-in as we go. And if we end up with, uh, with a product off the shelf, or if we end up with a custom solution, if we end up with uh, really a policy, it all has a rationale now. So that's part one. Part two is, you know, what can manufacturers do? It, in my opinion, manufacturers resist the urge to compete with the software powerhouses. Uh, you, you build products and they're physical products and you should endeavor to make these devices perform as well as they can within their intended purpose. We want the hardware to become the critical infrastructure for a fluid and ever-changing software platform, which may be, again, off the shelf. It might be a Google thing. It might be an Amazon thing. We don't know. Could be a homebrew product. Facilitate this by opening up your, your, your platform as much as you can. Um, create open APIs. Uh, and when we're looking at a smart building, the first thing we want is data. We, we want to see what's happening. We want to be able to create actionable intelligence. Controllability is second and integrations are third. What I'm leading to is that closed and proprietary systems are very problematic from the sense of integrations and also when we consider the long-term business agility for a client. Um, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, really points well taken there, I think, Steve. I think if I think back, what is it, nine years ago when the HD based D was still first developed, and I remember everybody told me, oh, the chipsets, they work with each other and they work with other manufacturers. And we all unfortunately learned the hard way that's so far from the truth. Um, and I think one of the cool things right now that's changing, and we're learning this from personal experience is with NDI, is that potentially this will be for the very first time a real open platform. 
And uh, we're seeing production pushing that. I mean, I mean, from this call, I think from a production basis, I think no one probably has more experience than Brad on this call. So Brad, same question to you. Given all the commoditization, you know, how do we create value? Yeah, it's interesting because when we think of commoditization, we also think of it as standardization, right? The more standard the technology becomes, you talked about NDI, which is a great example. The more standard it becomes, the more common it is, the lower the cost, the higher the use. But what we often discover is that commoditization creates similar, um, kind of a similar landscape, but the landscape often becomes really much more complex. So prior to the pandemic, when you thought about UC, you probably thought about Cisco or Microsoft or you know maybe Zoom. Today, we're still in the pandemic, although we can kind of see the end of it, hopefully from where we are, right? And we would say it's Zoom and Microsoft, maybe Cisco, but as, as UC becomes more and more commoditized, it's gonna be much more specialized, we think. So I might use Teams for my, my group meetings and internal calls. I might use Slack because it's integrated in with Salesforce as my, as my um, sales UC platform. I might think of, uh, you know, you think of Facebook Workspace, you think of Google Workplace, you think of all of the other UC platforms. And so what's gonna happen we think is that the landscape's gonna become more com complicated because there's gonna be more choices and each of those choices are gonna be more specialized. And what we think that's gonna result in is this drive, which we think is good for the industry and for the, and for the consumer as a whole, is this drive from function to delight. How do, I, how do I deliver a service that's not just functional for the user, but actually brings delight? And, and that requires us, I like what Steve was saying, that requires us to understand the biases of that user community, which is very different based on industry. It's very different across multiple generations. Um, and, and you have different perspectives of what technology is going to do or what it should be doing for you based upon just generational differences, as an example. Yeah, I think, Brad, to your point, you know, that's one of the, one of the uh, questions we got from the crowd from uh, Dai Tran, if you want to address it, is as technology advances, what's your opinion on AVIT merging together? Because that's part of this, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and the idea, I mean, AVIT has been merged for quite a while, right? But the issue is that you have a, an AV community that doesn't speak the IT language and you have an IT community that does, has a different set of expectations than the AV community. And so while it's been maybe together as a family, they don't really talk to each other much. So that's been part of the problem, at least from our perspective. Yeah, well, we're not talking about obviously your personal family issues. You know, we're talking about more of the industry. <laughs> of course, course. Say, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't worry, I'm guilty of it too. I have all family in every country at this point, you know, and uh, haven't seen some of my family members in the Middle East in four or five years, you know, it's crazy. Um, so uh, just, you know, another question, I think that's a good tag along to that because of COVID specifically, and this one, Bill uh, Thrasher, I'd love for you to address, how big of an impact will COVID have on, let's say, touches technology, right? And I know Scott Walker was on this very early on in the pandemic with his team, but from your perspective, how big of an impact will it have on that touch, techno touch technology and for how long, Bill? No, I, it's a great question. I think there's a two-part answer uh, that's kind of already been touched on by several of the other panelists. I think we've pushed forward in a very rapid uh, time frame to, to get to where the idea of a touchless meeting is, um, is a much more plausible and realistic goal for a lot of organizations, right? So to walk in, not have to grab a cable, not have to do anything in the meeting except hit maybe one button or no buttons and it, it auto senses my presence, it all automatically turns on the room and goes. That's a very, I think, uh, uh, forefront issue that we're all attacking right now in the market, every one of us is. Uh, that said, conversely, I'm not sure that COVID per particularly is going to have a legacy impact on what I would call the touch experience outside of maybe the meeting start. Um, it was a great point by Brad that we have these generational differences in the market right now. I mean, gen, uh, millennials are here, Gen Z's coming in, my son's 18, right? He's, he's four years away from the workforce. And I mean, he doesn't know a piece of lighted glass that shouldn't be touch, right? Operating systems, windows, all these things are, are moving to a touch experience inside the execution of the work workforce, the work day. So 
while the experience of a touchless connectivity is increasing, I think the idea of a touch enabled um, workday is increasing. So there's these kind of competing things happening there. We don't need to forego one without thinking about the other. We, I think both are important. And I think the touch experience in the work practice and that collaborative ex experience is something that maybe we're apprehensive of because of COVID, but we need to kind of be, I think more, you know, thinking long-term and, and have that in, in the in the purview for organizations that are really trying to grab that, you know, newer workforce that's coming in the market. So first off, Bill, thank you. That was extremely thorough. I think you nailed it. And I think, you know, from a manufacturer's perspective, Andy, I mean, you guys are creating solutions at Logitech all the time for this stuff. So not just what you're putting in my Florida showroom, but tell me just more of a big picture, I guess you could say, you know, what are you seeing? You know, how long is this going to last? So Bill made some excellent points there. And, and the, we were already in this transition of VC solutions. We're already going to USB based. Uh, what happened with COVID was it just threw everything into hyperdrive. So I don't see that it made any real uh, directional variations, maybe with some features that are being deployed in, in the hardware, such as, um, you know, AI features that could do head counts in rooms, right? Or spacing alerts uh, for COVID features and, and things like that. But it just accelerated that and it accelerated a lot of universities and corporations, long-term plans. A lot of most Fortune 500s have, you know, had plans in place for years, right? To upgrade certain conference rooms in a certain uh, amount of time and so forth as technology upgrades. But then everybody kind of had to take a step back and say, hey, we need to rethink this. So are our conference rooms more the classic conference room or are they more of a VC collaboration space? And that has been the change that I have seen um, due to COVID. And the, as I mentioned before, you know, corporations are recognizing that cost savings, right? That, that can add to their bottom line. You don't have to be in a certain location anymore. In a virtual world, you don't have to be on Wall Street, to be in Wall Street. You don't have to be in Silicon Valley to be in Silicon Valley. So we're seeing a lot of large corporations relocating to states that have lower tax rates or no state tax for the financial benefit of that as well, because we are in a virtual world now. And I don't see that changing. I only see it you know, advancing and evolving and becoming more effective um, as time goes on. Virtual communications, like I said, is never going to replace the benefit of face-to-face -face communications and engagement with your clients for relationship building, et cetera. But it is an excellent substitute and upgrade to your phone calls, to conference calls, to things like that. It makes it far more interactive with file sharing. And, and, I, and I am confident that the major players in the platform field, like Teams and Zoom, are going to come out with more and more features, just like Logitech and other manufacturers are coming out with more and more features to make it very easy for the client to use. One touch operation, even no touch if you wanted to. You know, you, you can have scheduling systems and then you walk into your conference room for your 11 o'clock scheduled meeting and it's already launched for you. So those things have kind of evolved and are gonna to continue to evolve. Um, but again, we it, 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 the hardware side is becoming more simplified, more feature rich that provide pretty much everything you would need in a conference room in a VC system. Yeah, Andy, I think you nailed it because I mean, if, even just from the real estate perspective, you know, one of the attendees, uh, Sefket Turan, um, you know, was alluding to something that Scott Walker mentioned earlier about real estate savings. And he mentioned that a, uh, a holding company, a CEO in Turkey, just from working from having his employees working from home saved $25 million, you know, so there is some pretty significant cost savings. And we're going to talk about the real estate side of that right now. Uh, because the question is, when are people coming back? How are they coming back? I mean, these are all relevant things. So, you know, Josh uh, Starkey from SKC will we'll allow you to address. How do you think the commercial real estate world would change in the next few years? Let's talk about that for a second. Well, I certainly think we're all anxious to find out. Um, and, you know, to, to the point of, uh, of Andy, you know, I, I read the other day that more people in 2020 left California than 
uh, been, been relocated to California um, in, in ages. And so that's, that's a pretty telling sign there. But, uh, you know, I personally don't expect it to change all that drastically, uh, but I'm confident it's going to look different. Um, you know, I, I, I'm confident a lot of organizations are reevaluating their footprint uh, just due to the, the tons and tons of unused square feet over the past 12, 13 months. Uh, it's got to be a tough pill to swallow for those CFOs. Uh, Scott mentioned earlier, I think a lot of organizations realized in this time that they can be successful with a full remote or even a hybrid model. Uh, you know, SKC is one of those organizations uh, that, that kind of realized some things. So, um, you know, with that said, I think as everybody begins to migrate back to the office, the economy swings back. And, uh, you know, I, I think I think we're going to see another big boom uh, like we were riding, uh, you know, in 2019 and before. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think one of the big differences is just the way that the workplaces are designed and, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be building around this need to support collaboration between those that are reporting to the office and those that are uh, remote, wherever that might be. Uh, ultimately, I think we're going to be just fine. But uh, again, pretty anxious to, to see how it plays out. Yeah. And, and to your, to your point, Josh, and it's funny because just from since I was here about a year and a half ago, I think it was in visiting Charlotte with you guys. And at the time there was very few cranes in downtown and most of the big corporations were in the suburbs at the time. And now I come here and there's cranes everywhere in downtown, build, build, building downtown. And it's interesting because in other major cities you were seeing during the pandemic, people moved to the suburbs right? Not just working from home in the suburbs, but offices and remote locations were being built in the suburbs. So it's very interesting how different markets react to these things. And, you know, I know we have also a Britain from Newcomb Boyd. I mean, I'm sure you're seeing this as well in real estate. I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you're absolutely right. That's one of the things that's, you know, it's hard to judge in terms of years because people tend to have a short memory and especially, uh, trends in corporate real estate, you know, can kind of swing back and forth. Uh, but, you know, as stated, I, I think that we, we do know that a hybrid workforce will be extremely common. And with those environments, leaders have to create an incentive for their employees to actually leave home and come back into the office. If they're going to make the investment in real estate, that real estate has to bring some value back. Um, and so that incentive can be amenities or tools, but I think the primary trends that we're seeing now and the differences we're seeing now are opening with more open collaboration spaces to, to enable that face-to-face -face interaction that we've all you know, been missing and less of a sea of work desks. Um, so the, the real estate's just kind of being reallocated. They're trying to create collision spaces and teamwork spaces and uh, scrum spaces um, and things like that. So you know, Scott said earlier that, you know, every space now we need to assume is remote participant capable. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I don't think that's something that we're just theorizing on. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of clients that are reutilizing resource management and analytics, you know, with occupancy sensing and people counting and, you know, room reservation tracking. And we're finding that spaces that do not allow for remote participation are just simply not being used. People aren't reserving them. People aren't going in them in an impromptu nature we need to be able to support that virtual collaboration and not just in an audio uh, call either, but sharing resources, sharing, you know, their, their whiteboarding and their, and their notes um, and, and things like that. And so uh, I think that's kind of, th th that's what we're seeing is trying to build those spaces. And that's where we're seeing the, the corporate real estate market going right now. Thank you, Britton. I, I think the market's clearly changing. And, you know, we had one of the comments coming from uh, Di Tran about with COVID-19, seeing how companies address the team building issues, right? Because so many people are remote. And it's interesting because that's actually what the next question we're going to be addressing now is that changing purpose of the workplace, right? So virtual team building, yeah, that's definitely a real thing. There's no question about it. I mean, I'm engaged with not just our consultants, not just our manufacturer partners, not just our integrators, but on a regular basis, their entire teams, because to get a good feel of what they're up to, you know, and not everyone I get it feels comfortable to have a beer, right? With someone else right now during this time or get together for a coffee. I mean, I had to have <laughs> with one of uh, Scott's, Scott's employees, I had a, a pickup truck with, you know, in, in a parking lot of Starbucks the other week, you know, you know, it's everyone has to do what feel comfortable, but the workplace is clearly changing. And as our next question, I'll, you know, I'll let Brad, you address this. I know your team is heavily involved in the corporate space. What's the changing, perp you know, the changing purpose of the workplace, right? Is, is it a new meeting place? You know, how dramatic will that be? And, and at what cost, I guess, right? Yeah, and I am super passionate about this topic. I talk about it a lot. We, we think that the, that the workplace is the new meeting place. It's actually 
not going to be Starbucks. Once people really start going back to the office, it's really going to be um, the office is the workplace is the new meeting place. We think there's two really big kind of um, uh, pressures or attention that is creating this change. One is we talked about this a little bit earlier. It was this idea of multiple generations in the workforce. And in particular, um, Gen Zers and millennials, they were taught from grade school that the most valued form of work is community work. I mean, I'm a boomer. I was taught that the most valued form of work was independent work. And so the, the reality that a, a younger workforce, a, a Gen Z or millennial community, I'm not gonna try and label anybody, but that, that demographic, they've been taught from, the, from early on that community-based work is the most valued form of work. And the, the way they solve problems is to crowdsource it right away and, and to bring back my recommendation to the team based upon not just the number of facts that I have, but how many people agree with the position that I'm taking. And we've reconstructed the office to support that kind of, of work. We've taken down walls and doors and created community-based workspaces. And then through the pandemic, we've systematically deconstructed the sense of workplace community. So a lot of our workforce wants to go back to the workplace just because we need that sense of workplace community. I can be efficient by myself working at home, but I don't know that I have my purpose in my work when I work by myself working from home. And so that's, we think, one of the primary reasons that's gonna motivate workforce, workforce back to the workplace. The second, and Britton talked a little bit about this, the second is the fact that we're gonna create experiences at the workplace that are really going to motivate people to get on a plane, travel across the country, and not just see the product or have a conversation, but experience something, see something that you can't see over video, experience something you can't experience over video. And largely that's gonna be connecting you, not just to our product or service, but connecting you to our brand, our culture, our way of doing business, breaking down barriers so that we can come up with big ideas and move big initiatives forward. It's those experiences and the need for the workplace to get back and restore a sense of workplace community that we think is going to make the workplace the new meeting place. Yeah, the new meeting place is definitely a big part of this. You know, it's, uh, I think we're all, you know, and again, I want to be very clear, I don't own stock in uh, Starbucks. I want to clarify my earlier comments. I'm not <laughs> against Dunkin' Donuts either. Uh, as long as it's cold brew, I don't care where it comes from. Um, but, you know, obviously nitro, cold brew is great there too. Um, but, you know, going along with that line of thought, you know, I would be curious, you know, Chris, to hear your thoughts because it's definitely a changing world. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. yeah, Brad, I love that you focus on experience and, you know, joy and what happens to users as they come to a space. And yeah. I think, it, like I was saying earlier, the shining the light on those, these, those like reasons to have brick and mortar or reasons to get on a plane and go somewhere that that's been one of the positive outcomes, I think, of the pandemic. It's, you know, if I'm a little bit negative for a minute, so three months into the pandemic, you know, I was on a similar panel like this, and and there was a lot of talk about how productive we all are, how great it is that we can all now focus and dig in, and how great this is going to be. We've discovered this new level of productivity. The reality is it's somewhat zero sum, right? In hindsight, now that we've gone through it, we're realizing what we did is traded creativity and engagement and mentorship and meaningful friendships and you know, things that just create new ideas for productivity, which is fine, but you can't do that for very long. In fact, I, I talked to one of our big uh, customers. He's like, a, they're a sporting goods manufacturer. And they were like, we're paranoid now because we realize what's going on is we had a lot of projects in flight that could just be about productivity now through the year. It's time to create new products. And now we <laughs> need to get back together and realize, oh my gosh, that's going to, you know, re realize that it takes in-person technology changes everything so you know if i if i take a step back and i think about us as a community and how exciting it is in a sense that there was this massive disruption right smack dab in the middle of the things we think about and work on every day that means that we get to re-envision where the workplace goes i mean it's partly up to us too Shannon, you're asking what's going to happen part of it's going to be what we decide is going to happen as a community so that's really cool i think we should envision the workplace as a place that embraces the individual's ecosystem of devices, 
their own applications, their choices about where they go, how do they book rooms? We can no longer say, you know, you got to go over to this system, you got to log into this, you got to pre-schedule a room, you got to go to it. Why not have a space that gets me seamless transitions from working in my home to walking into a room and it auto books the room, recognizes it's me, puts my next meeting on the calendar for that room, emails my collaborators right then and says, Chris decided he's going to be on campus today. Why don't you join him? You know, he's on the third floor. Or why not build, you know, systems that allow me to like, a, you know, we, we've been working on obviously, and I'm a bit biased, but you can open your laptop and launch a video conferencing call with wireless access to that room. It's you got to start to ask really hard questions too, like what needs to remain in the workplace to support those kind of, you know, those visions and what needs to get out of the way. And if you're really, really honest about it, you know, a room that has great group series cameras, you know, that can see everything, great room audio, the ability to have room intelligence to curate the user's experience to say, your meeting's about to end, but guess what? We can take you, you know, one floor up to an even better room that just broke, you know, broke open. Why don't you guys all walk upstairs and migrate to a new space? Those are things that we should be exploring technologically, uh, training-wise, you know, everything, HR, corporate policy, that, all that stuff is going to change to embrace, I think, those visions. And it's kind of what I meant about the time machine at the beginning. It's it's kind of cool. It's like we open the door and we're now in the new workplace. It's just we have to hurry and catch up as a community and make sure that we we embrace these technologies that will allow the users to get there. They're there. The users want that right now. I mean, I have a customer council and I ask them, what are the top five challenges? And literally number five in the top five is I can't find my collaborators anymore. Already they're seeing the hybrid issues, right? So it's a really exciting time to, to develop. I think it's going to be up to us how we build this new workplace. Yeah, Chris, I think you nailed it. I It's funny because only when, you know, PrimeView became um, AIA certified to give continued education credits, did I start to really understand the challenges because the architects would tell me something. I'm like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, the technology guy said this and you say this. I'm like, there has to be a medium. And, and they, they didn't always understand from an architectural side limitations with facilities and real estate. So all this stuff sounds really great on the technology side, but if there's really not that broken down of that wall between the architects, the designers, and everyone involved, and the integrators and the manufacturers, I mean, it's very hard to execute. So I love your thoughts and thank you. Yeah, Chidan, it's, it's important because we are the last hop. This community is the last hop to the eyes, the ears, the experience of the user. And that means we got to be integrated with the architectural design, with the space design, everything. It's, it's exciting. It's going to be an exciting few years to come for sure. Um, next question we have up is, uh, Josh, I'll leave you an opportunity here. With the emergence of IoT, are AV companies prepared to assist customers with a full transition to the cloud for control, audio, and video transport? Love to hear your thoughts. Well, I sure hope so, because uh, I definitely think it's coming. Um, you know, I'm not sure we'll see a full transition in the, in the near term, but uh, we've already seen so much of it. You know, deployment and management or monitoring support that stuff seems to be the low hanging fruit and so much of it has already uh, been, you know, kind of transitioned to the cloud, um, you know, with, with the time sensitivity of audio and video transport, I think it'll be a little while before the infrastructure and bandwidth, uh, you know, needed to support that um, in, a, in a full cloud model is going to be here. But, uh, you know, the fact that the, so much of the IT space has already moved off-prem and, uh, you know, it just makes these discussions a lot easier. Um, you know, the AV software is, is oftentimes hosted in the same data centers as these other applications. So we really don't have to work so hard to, to earn the trust of the IT department. Yeah, your, your thoughts are very well noted. I, I think it's a real issue and people have to address it. I mean, Bill from AV Tech, I'd love to hear your thoughts there. No, I, I concur. And I, I think, um, you know, from a control standpoint, I'm not sure we're quite there. And I don't know if we'll get there. I think I see a, a very similar model to maybe how digital signage has been handled for quite some time where you have a, a local on-prem, you know, device that repositories a, a, a baseline uh, execution file for the day, right? Whether it's a playlist or the control for a room. The, the management, the remote stuff can all be handled, uh, but that on-demand experience needs to be pretty instantaneous. And so I think there's some hybrid stuff. Uh, I'll be honest, uh, as an integrator, I think if, you're, if a client's willing to live inside of a really tight ecosystem, you can get a lot of this today. But I, I think, you know, that's the challenge is then you kind of limit your, you know, 
flexibility. And so we're seeing other uh, independent pieces pop up, but then I'm managing more cloud-based functions and cloud-based management. And there's going to be a shakeout, I think, five, within the next five years of how that all kind of collides in the market. So um, all that said, also, I think, you know, integrators have to get up to speed on network topology and their ability to uh, to get to that that IT level of, of knowledge. And uh, clients have to get to a level of uh, complacency and complicitness with it allowing IoT and cloud-based connectivity to happen. And all these things are colliding and, and they're all a moving target right now. So the answer is kind of, a, I don't know, yes, no, all the above. <laughs> so. no, no, you nailed it. It's funny because I'm working with uh, Brad's team on a, a new control room. And I, and I explained to one of his engineers, the reason why we created this checklist on a video wall processor is because all too many times, because so many end users are thinking about an appliance, I ask for this, I get this. And if they alter it ever so slightly, it's screwed. So, I mean, I'm working with Brad's team, literally, I'm like, this is a checklist. If you want us to quote it, you yeah. have to fill out this checklist. And they're like, uh, we don't know all the answers. I'm like, well, then how am I supposed to quote it? <laughs> and I think it's such an important process. You have to answer the questions to get to the net right. results of positivity. That's right. So, um, next question, because it really li you know, goes right into that as a perfect uh, segue. Uh, what are the challenges in employing smart or integrated technologies, often defined as innovative technologies or innovative advisor? And, and I guess this is a perfect opportunity for Silicon Valley. Uh, Steve, it's all you. This is great. I, I think that this is, there's two, two parts to this question. One is that smart and innovative doesn't mean anything by itself. And this is where you have an opportunity to really work with your client to define what that actually means. And so, of course, it always works best when you help the client understand what smart is and what innovative is in the context of their goals. So for example, if you were to explain to them that you're going to use building technology to really automate their goals and increase the success of that goal as much as you can, that starts to have a compelling um, a compelling story for the client. Um, so yes, you have an opportunity to define what smart is and, and really kind of bridge that intellectual uh, gap that the client may have. You know, often clients are thinking, gosh, smart is expensive. Do I really need it? What is it? That's one. The other thing is that smart technologies, more innovative technologies are often very siloed. It's just a physics of, uh, of the manufacturing process. So as your product line becomes more specialized and its capability increases, it's, it, it narrows as far as what it can, uh, can accomplish. And so gaps begin to develop. And so as an integrator or as a consultant, it's really important to help the client understand where those gaps are and how to bridge them through either automations, um, specialty integrations or policy or a mixture of all the above. Yeah, you nailed it there, Steve. I, I think, you know, Scott, this is something we've spoken about very early on the pandemic, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Well, uh, I'm a sunny side up guy. So for me, uh, I've been pushing rope for 10 years about smart buildings. And now finally, people are coming to us and, and the other consultants and, and folks on this call to say, uh, yeah, we, we need a smart building. Uh, so one of the things the pandemic has done because of hybrid work is they need data now. Where do you get data? You get data from sensors, you get data from software, mobile apps, uh, that sort of thing. Well, you don't get any of that if you have a dumb building, right? Um, and, and I do talks on um, why buildings remain stupid. And part of it's like what Steve said, they're not purpose-built single entities. There's a mechanical system, there's elevator systems, there are you know AV systems, and none of them have anything to do with the other, right? What we need to do is net all that together. The big challenge right now that we have is that the AE industry and, and the RFP writers of the world don't really know how to scope this work. They don't know how to ask for it. And so it's very hard to respond to it. So we need to take it incrementally. There needs to be the discovery phase. Which aspects of the smart building do you want? Then there can be another bid if you want to take it to design. There also needs to be the emergence of the master systems integrator. And I think some of the firms on this call and other leading integration companies Honestly, guys, we're the smartest ones out there. Let's do that ourselves, you know, um, not hand it off to some other third party. We, we've been doing the hard integration thing for 30 years, making this camera talk to this 
control processor in these shades and this light, we're already there, right? And the thing is people have been buying three quarters of a smart building anyway. They've been buying intelligent lighting or intelligent shades. They haven't glued it together. We need to be the glue because honestly, AV is gonna get simpler. So let's go to the hard place and the hard place of smart buildings. You know, Scott, you really raised a good point. It's funny because one of the first things I ask when I'm working specifically with a, an integrator is, are you responding to a bid or is this a design build? And they're like, just give me a price. I don't care. I said, no, because if I give you a bid, I'm just giving you what you want. But if I actually ask you if you're doing a design build, I can give you what you need because I, then I can understand what you're trying to accomplish. And I think that's really the net result that you're talking about because you want to make sure that everything is integrated seamlessly. But unless you're involved, like you said, from the beginning to the end, I mean, not every consultant does that, but I know, I know your team definitely does. And I know Britain's team does it. And I know the integrators on this call do it is being involved from then beginning to end, right? And being involved and, in the process. Actually beyond the end, right? There is no end. You just keep doing, right? So you're in the analytics business, you're in the ongoing support business. Once you've you know, broken that seal, you don't leave, which is a good thing. You can make money throughout all of that and make your client happy. God willing, God willing. So we're going to do a quick lightning round here. I'm going to ask uh, all the panelists to give a quick response here so we stay in the time, time a lot allotted to us. So this is the final question. So if, if you're still watching with us, hold on to your seats. This will get fun. So final question. Everybody claims they want simplicity, right? But let's be honest. The request is more about flexibility. So what key technology development should we be watching to integrate into new designs or existing, existing spaces to accomplish both. So Chris, I'll give you the first 30 seconds, go for it. Yeah, yeah, I think the, the obvious answer for me when it comes to simplicity is allow users to use what they normally do. So that's a bring your own meeting approach to a room design. If I walk into a room and I've got a laptop that has you know Zoom or Teams on it, can I open that laptop and leverage the room system easily? I think those are the kind of things you should keep an eye on. Past that, AI and machine learning is here for sure now. I like Scott's talking about you know smart buildings. I think that's huge. Analytics will help drive the return to work. It'll help drive people's behavior in that space. So keep an eye on some stuff there. We're in beta actually with some very heavy, AI. my background's AI, so I love this. We're driving some very heavy AI stuff that's related to wayfinding and room booking. So it's coming. God willing, God willing. Chris, thanks so much. Um, really loved your thoughts there. Quick 30 seconds as well, Josh from SKC. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing I'm personally keeping an eye on is just the improvement and progress of interoperability. Uh, you know, the UC platforms are so much more proprietary today than they were when we were using, you know, hardware-based codecs. Um, you know, until there's a clean way to tie them all together, uh, the end users are going to continue to be the ones struggling. Um, we, we've seen a lot of great progress from the manufacturers, a couple of which we've we've heard from this morning, um, and I'm just really excited to see what uh, what, what they come up with next. God willing, God willing. Thank you so much for your thoughts there. So uh, we also have uh, Bill Thrasher. I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, uh, something that uh, John just said, I wrote down, end users are struggling. And I think there's a there's a facet here that, from my opinion, is, is the uh, intangible that we can't ever not consider. And Scott mentioned it too, it's the ongoing support. And I think at some level, technology just stops being the solution and we get back to people and you get back to a, a building that has on-call IT support and they've had that for 30 years, but they've never had AV support. They've never had an experienced minded person to respond within two minutes and assist. And I think that's gonna be a shift we see dynamically in our industry where objectively minded IT people have their role, but subjectively minded AV experts need to be there, have a presence and help with all this flexibility and simplicity trying to collide in the, in the office place. Yeah, you nailed it. It's funny because uh, one of uh, Brad's guys from AVI Systems, when we were talking about a project just about a year and a half ago uh, for one of his financial customers, um, for Lauren uh, Spazito, it was just about simplicity. That's what they wanted. So Brad, your thoughts as well. Yeah, I think um, all of the technologies we've been talking about today um, are no longer individual silos. They've got to be integrated together. And so it's going to be less about the technology specifically, and it's going to be more about how it's consumed. And that's going to want to drive uh, super simple unified workflows, things that make it easy for our users to consume the technology. Yeah, love, love that idea. Um, Scott from Waveguide. Yeah, so 
I'll take simplicity and then flexibility. Simplicity is not an option. It's not a you, either or. It has to be because the worst thing that could happen is people start to go back to the office and they go, you know what, I'm going back home. This is this isn't any more productive. And in fact, it's less productive. That would be an epic fail. We need to be working now, not six months from now, but right now to reimagine these rooms so when people do come back, they have a new experience. Flexibility, much trickier, right? Because if you game this out, the built environment will be the ever building environment. Walls are becoming furniture systems, right? Uh, you know, the open plan is kind of going to go the way of the dinosaur. So what's going to happen is these flexible neighborhoods, which means basically uh, everything should be POE. Everything should be connected to the network so that you just blanket the place with sound and, and video and all that. And, and you, all the equipment's down in the MDF, IDF or off-prem in, in the cloud. And we're not, you know, so much building rooms as we are just building floors and building buildings that you can constantly refigure and you don't have to pull out the drywall tools. I sure hope we do it that right direction. I am, uh, I'm hopeful that one day we'll have a big uh, 200 inch LED wall that's POE. I'm hopeful, but we'll see how we're able to accomplish that. Maybe solar power, I don't know. Um, um, same question, uh, Andy, uh, 30 seconds, go for it please from Logitech perspective as well. So from a hardware perspective, um, I, you know, and I, 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 I've been preaching this for years, standardization is key. Uh, you've got so many more rooms now, especially in corporate environments that are smaller. Instead of having 100 large conference rooms, you might have 500 smaller conference rooms. And so to have standardized equipment so that your employees and users have a uniform experience, no matter what room they're in, they're in as, as well as at home, if they're working from home, then you have a guarantee that all the equipment communicates properly and works properly because it's all a singular platform. Now, we run into issues on the software side, right? Where everybody wants to have access to Zoom and Teams and all these other things, right? So right now, until those entities start playing nice together and allowing manufacturers to deploy multiple platforms on a single device, we have to do hardware workarounds in order to give you a uh, room agnostic uh, operability, okay? So the, the, and then you have with, with the standardization, you have one neck to choke, right? At, you know, and that's kind of a crass way to put it, but at the end of the day, you have limited resources, you have more rooms, you have IT people, right? That are trying to manage all these rooms. And so by standardizing on a single manufacturer, then you can go into a device management portal, manage all your devices globally from a single desktop, which saves on manpower and, you know, the overhead costs of managing all these rooms and things like that. So there's two different caveats there, the software side and the hardware side. Um, but the hardware industry part of it really seems to be ahead of the game. We, we really are create, we've created products that are ready for the next evolution of the software platforms that they have certain features that are still being baked a little bit more, you know, they're not quite there yet, but the hardware devices are ready for them when those, um, when those features are finished and deployed and so forth. So that would be the, the main thing I would, I would emphasize for people to take away is standardization across the board. It, it will make your entire life easier. And just to be clear, when Andy was saying software companies not ready, he was not referring to Chris and Mercer. I just want to be very mm -hmm. clear about that one. Um, the next one, uh, Britton, would love to hear your clothing thoughts. Sure. Uh, yeah. And I think the question has been really well answered so far. Um, so I think the, the the bullet point for me is that, you know, when we look at simplicity and when we look at flexibility, I don't think those are mutually exclusive terms um, because in, in, in my experience, the root of the requests are really two different things. When we talk about simplicity, I think the request, the, the root of the request is a system design. It's simple so that we know it's reliable, less failure points. And then also the ease of use. It's just an intuitive user interface, something that the user can just walk in and use and consistent between spaces. Um, and then the request for flexibility is more, you know, as, as Scott was referencing, the, uh, you know, open plans and uh, trying to create more spaces for collisions. And also, you know, with the return to work, a lot of times I think we're not exactly sure what's going to work best there uh, because we we don't exactly have a prerequisite for this pandemic yet and what the return to work is going to look like. So uh, I think we have a lot of people that are coming into the corporate office almost as beta testers for what these new open neighborhoods are going to be. Um, and so they have to be flexible for that. But uh, 
but but that's not that doesn't necessarily com complicate system design. We can we have cloud services to bring us some flexibility between platforms, um, and we have you know AV over IP systems that can we can maintain the same platform and same user experience and 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 be able to plug into different places. So um, so yeah, I, th I think that both of those things can be accomplished. Excellent, Britton. Thanks so much for your comments there. And uh, lastly, Steve, uh, give an opportunity for Silicon Valley to give their response. Sure thing. Yeah. So I agree. Simplicity and flexibility, not mutually exclusive. Uh, really, I mean, flexibility comes from investing in great hardware and a robust infrastructure. A microphone, a great microphone, a great camera, those things, we're an analog entity. So we need, we need quality products. Um, and then the simplicity comes from understanding what to reveal to your client. This is where the magic comes. You can explain what you've decided to allow them to touch and what, the, and what they're able to control and what you've enabled to happen behind the scenes like magic. So in short, great hardware, plan to pivot on the software side. Excellent. So I want to, uh, first of all, uh, thank all the panels for joining. Um, if you want to get in touch with anybody here, the easiest way I would say across the board is LinkedIn, we would agree. Um, that way uh, they get filter. Um, but I want to thank, give a th build, big thanks uh, to Bill Thrasher, give him a quick wave. Uh, I want to give a big thank you to Scott Walker from Wave Guy, give a quick wave. Uh, Josh Starkey from SKC. Uh, Britton, give a quick wave. Uh, Chris uh, from Mercer, thank you so much. Uh, Brad from AVI System, quick wave. And then lastly, Andy, my Florida neighbor, thank you so much as well. Um, there will be a recording available um, in the coming days for everybody here. I want to thank everybody for attending, as well as the panelists for having the patience to deal with Hanan on a day-to-day -day basis. I know that's not easy always, so thank you. Um, I, I obviously am not the only one that does uh, LinkedIn and text message and emails at four o'clock in the morning, I noticed, or 11 o'clock at night at the same 24-hour cycle. So thank you, everybody, for being involved. And uh, this was some phenomenal panel here. I think this will be the first many to come for AV Thought Leadership. So thank you all for joining and uh, have a blessed day.